let's get right into the topic. We're going to talk about the new QBO uh, banking API versus Web Connect Express versus manual upload. So let's start with what is Web Connect Express. Uh, Web Connect Express is the underlying technology that QuickBooks Online uses to connect to financial institute, institutions. In the Intuit world, they call it web scraping. So basically what they do is they log into the website of the bank and they basically copy like sort of an HTML copy. The transactions are shown to the users. Because of that, forever we've had this limitation of 90 days is the, the most amount of transactions you can download through Web Connect Express, which is when you put the username and password is 90 days. So unfortunately, that's been the limitation that we, we've had. Now, the great thing about Web Connect Express and what really makes it stand out, especially when you compare it with QuickBooks Desktop, is that still with Web Connect Express, uh, QuickBooks Online can log in every single night and download the transactions daily. That's always been one of the great things of QuickBooks Online Banking, although it has that 90-day limitation. Now, you could always upload a .qbo file or a CSV file to get more than those 90 days, but that's always going to be a manual process, and that doesn't update automatically. Now, what Intuit has done, and also, just let me go back for a second. So the way you know you are using Web Connect Express is when you connect to the bank, you see the credentials inside the browser. So when you go uh, into QBO and you click on Connect Bank, if you see a user ID and password screen inside the browser without a pop-up, you know that you're using the old, let's call it old, Web Connect Express. And I'll show you screenshots of what it looks like with the new banking API. So what's the new banking API? It, it, they, had, they now extended six months to two years worth of transactions. At some point, it will be even beyond two years, it will be basically limited to the bank's archive. But this new initiative is to force all checking accounts from participating banks to give you as much as two years worth of transactions. And I believe that for saving and money market accounts are still limited to six months. I don't know why, but for checking accounts, it's uh, two years. Now the banks that are participating in this as of July uh, 2019 is Bank of America, Chase, Capital One, Citibank, PNC, and Wells Fargo. So if you are connecting to any of these banks, the experience will be different, significantly different. I'll show you all the screenshots of what that looks like. And the, the, one of the additional enhancements to the, two, to, to the API is not just the two years worth of transactions, it's also the connections don't break due to security issues. The API makes a straight connection to the bank. Once you're credentialed in, um, I haven't tested this yet because I haven't had clients change their passwords, but supposedly even if your password changes, the connection doesn't break. So this is going to be huge. You're probably going to be seeing most of the banks come in in the next couple of months, I would say. Um, uh, but uh, for now, it's just these six banks that are listed here. So how do you know that you're using the new API? And it's pretty simple. Basically, when you start the connection process, you will not see a username and password. You will actually see a screen letting you know, hey, we need to connect to your bank. So you will notice that there's a separate screen and you have to click on continue. If you see this screen when you're connecting and you don't see the credentials inside the QuickBooks Online window, that's how you know it's using the new API. So for example, if you're using Chase, you will get a pop-up screen and make sure you turn off your pop-up blocker because that's a common issue. If you pop up blockers on, the, the connection won't work. So make sure you have your pop up blocker and turned off. You're going to see a pop up of your actual, the actual bank. So Chase Bank of America will have its own pop up. You will see on the URL in the, bo in, in the top, you will see that it's a Chase or a Bank of America or a Wells Fargo. You will see it's a different URL. You're going to log in. You're going to log in to the bank directly. I, then after you log in, it's going to give you a list of all the active accounts that you could potentially connect to QuickBooks Online. You can choose all of them. So if you have credit cards, checking accounts, savings accounts, even personal accounts, if they're linked to that uh, ID, you will see all the ones that you will have to select them to see which ones you want to bring. There's also this awesome new feature they added, which is called share accounts I open in the future with QuickBooks. So basically, if you hit that checkbox, you're authorizing QuickBooks Online to essentially uh, download transactions from a brand new account added to the bank's login without having to re-log in and re-credential 
And so you just click on connect, click on the bank, and then the pop-up screen will pop up and it will show you all the new accounts that were added. That's really awesome. That's really great. Um, and a few people are asking, is there a cost to that? No, banks don't charge for this. This is a, an initiative from Intuit and the banks. It's an agreement. They're working together to do this. This, this is going to have zero cost, or at least I haven't seen any, any cost. So after you connect the banks, you will get a list of all the uh, accounts that you chose to download, and you have to pick and map them in your chart of accounts. So if, if you haven't created the bank accounts or the credit cards, you have to create them on the fly. And then at the bottom, you will get a drop-down menu where you can choose how much of the transactions that you want. So you're going to get this month, this year, and last year. Those are the three default options. There's also today, but nobody chooses that. Uh, so this month, this year, last year, clean months, or you can click on custom, and the custom screen allows you to select any date. So you can go back to any date. If you go back outside of the, per the period, which currently is 24 months, or basically it's rolling two years, it'll give you an error and it'll tell you, hey, the earliest available is 7 18 2017. If you scroll through the calendar, you will actually see at some point, you're going to see that you can't select the dates anymore. And that will let you know what is the single oldest date that is available. This is all, again, those six banks that I mentioned earlier that are using uh, the new API. Now, new QBO banking API, really important thing. This will not generate payments. This will not generate pay bills. This is not like the legacy QuickBooks online or QuickBooks desktop connection that actually allows, um, give me one second, screen popped up. Okay, that actually allows the, the, the uh, QuickBooks to generate or initiate a bill payment. This has nothing to do with that and this will not work like that. And I, don't ha I have reason to believe that it's probably never gonna work like that. It's not designed uh, to do that. There is a bill pay feature, which some people call bill.com Lite uh, in QuickBooks Online, which is totally unrelated to this. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, uh, but those two things will be completely independent. I got a lot of questions from, hey, does a new direct connection do bill payments? The answer is, it's no. Now, what about uh, banks that you don't have that two years worth of transactions that you can bring in? What, what, what if that's the case, right? Banks that don't allow me to do that. And, and I do need to get a year, two years worth. Then your option is to download a .qbo file, not qbo, .qbo file or a CSV file manually and upload it. Now, there's two differences between the qbo file and the CSV file. The CSV file only accepts three fields, date, description, and amount, where the QBO file can bring date, description, memo, transaction number, and amount. In other words, if you upload a CSV file, you cannot bring check numbers. If you upload a CSV file, you cannot bring separate uh, payee versus separate memo. Now, the CSV file can be edited. That's one of the great advantages of a CSV file. It's just an Excel file, basically. So kind of the pros and cons there. Now, the, one of the also important things is when you download a CSV file or a QBO file manually through the bank, they sometimes contain different information. I mean, they, they'll contain the same dates and amounts, but they'll contain different information, like the actual payee information. So I, I tend to believe that the CSV file is only like emergency type of situations. I think the .qbo file is the best. QuickBooks Online does not have a limitation on how, much, how many years worth of data you can bring in manually through the manual upload. It's all basically limited to whatever the bank can give you. So to give you some context, for example, if you're using Chase, and Chase is a bad example because it has a new API, but let's just, just, let's just go with it. So if you're using Chase and you wanted to manually download a, uh, a file, when you go into the download screen, it gives you the option. Do you want to download a Web Connect QBO or do you want to download a CSV file? That's really what it means. So anything that says the word Web Connect QBO or .QBO, that's what they're talking about. That's what we're talking about when it comes to uh, QBO file. Okay. Now, in the banking screen, the way you upload a manual file, CSV or QBO, is by you click on banking. And then inside the update button on the top right, it's sort of hidden. 
you have to click on the little arrow, which is a drop down menu, and then click on file upload. That's the only way you're going to get to upload the file into banking. The next screen will basically say, hey, are you sure you want to do the manual or would you like to just connect the bank, right? So at this point, you probably know that connecting the bank is not an option or whatever. So you're going to click on the left hand side where it says browse. You're going to find the QBO file that you downloaded through your bank somewhere in your computer, hopefully in the desktop or in the downloads window, something sort of easy to find. And then you click on open. Then you do the, the mapping. So you basically select your account from your chart of accounts uh, that's already in your chart of accounts and you map it. Unfortunately, on this screen, you cannot create new transactions on the fly. So you would have to create the account prior to uploading the manual transactions because the drop down won't give you an add button. Then you click on yes and that's it. Now, when I work personally on, on large projects, right? So somebody shows up, typical scenario, somebody will show up in July right now and they says, hey, Hector, I haven't filed returns in two years. Well, I need all of 2017 and I need all of 2018, right? So when I go to do, even if I use the API, I'm limited to like July of 2017. So I have to manually go in the bank and request to get uh, January 1st of 2017 all the way to maybe July of 2017. And then on the API, or with a new API connected from maybe August on, right? In the, ca in the case that you don't have the new API and you can only get three months worth, then you, you download the two complete months prior uh, via the direct connection. So you download two, and then you manually upload whatever it is that you need to catch up. So in some cases, you need to use a combination. Now for, and people have heard me talk about this all the time. If you cannot download a QBO file from the, from the bank, or you cannot get a CSV file from the bank, and the only thing you have is a PDF bank statement, and you don't want to enter that stuff by hand, you can actually use a program called 2QBOConvertPro.com. Uh, you can just go to that website. It's like 350 bucks, not cheap, but it's an incredible tool. And you can convert a PDF statement, whether it's a scanned or a digital one. Digital works better, of course. You can convert it to a .QBO file so you can make QuickBooks behave just as if it's, it connected to the bank uh, when your source was only a PDF file. Okay, so that's, uh, that covers that. So now let's move on to navigating bank feeds. And we're gonna go into the uh, demo in a second. I just wanna go through all the slides because there's a lot of great terminology and I know some of you guys take screenshots on the flights, so that's good as well. Uh, somebody's asking, can we download the slides? Yeah, if you log into the members only portal, the slides will be there around 4 p.m. Eastern today, uh, as soon as I'm done with this webinar and the q and I'm gonna, I may add some stuff during the Q&A if there's anything interesting in there. Okay, so let's talk about navigating bank feeds. So a couple of terms that is really, really important for us to make sure we understand. In the QBO bank feeds, you're essentially gonna have three options. One is add, the other one is match, and the other one is transfer. They've actually recently updated it to uh, record transfer, make it a bit more clear. So add is to create a new transaction. It doesn't exist in QuickBooks. It's brand new. The, the first time that QuickBooks has ever seen it is when you downloaded it through the bank. Match means there's a related transaction already in the book. So there might be an invoice and a payment to the invoice is being downloaded. Or there might be a bill and the bill to the payment is being downloaded. Or there's a transfer you know, from bank account to bank account and that's already inside QuickBooks. So what the match does is it doesn't really do anything. It just removes it from your, from your bank feeds. So it doesn't prompt you to do anything with it anymore. And then it marks it cleared. Because that's really the concept of matching. It's just marking the transaction cleared. Now the transfer or record transfer, it's like add, but it creates a transfer transaction. Now transfer transactions are limited to balance sheet only. So if you're a novice user and you use the transfer feature, and then you go back and realize that you screwed up, um, you really can't change it quite easily. So that, be, that, that becomes a bit uh, complicated. So I personally prefer to simply just avoid transfer altogether. Like assume it's bad, right? So you see, you see transfer, hit something else. Right? Transfer should be reserved to advanced users only. And I, unfortunately, I wish there was a preference where I could just turn it off. You can do everything a transfer can with just doing a check and expense or a deposit. So again, avoid transfer unless you're a really advanced user and you know exactly what you're doing. 
So what do all these things mean once you're on the screen? So in the banking screen, those are the three buttons that you see on top of each transaction, add, find, match, or uh, record transfer. Now, this one says find match because the transaction wasn't automatically matched. The screen will look different, and I'll show you that when we're going in depth in the product. Um, it will look different if QuickBooks already found a match and will suggest a match for you instead of suggesting an ad. So in this case, find the match is when QuickBooks couldn't find it and you're manually going to find it. We'll do an example of that. It'll make tons of sense. And then record transfers, as I mentioned, it creates a new transaction. Record transfers just like ad, but it's automatically a transfer transaction. Now, notice a couple of things that's just really important to keep in mind. If you, if you don't turn off the automatic vendor description cleanup feature, QuickBooks will attempt to clean up the, the, the description for you and give you their own version of it. Now, sometimes it's great. Like in this case, the bank called it Costco WHSE0742. That's the actual text from the bank. You see it on the memo. Uh, QuickBooks converted that to just Costco. Hey, that's nice. Okay, that's, that's great. But for a lot of times, it's not as accurate as that. I'm in Miami. I go to a lot of restaurants with Spanish names. QBO butchers those descriptions all the time. So... I'm just worried that just AI is not there, but obviously they're using aggregate data and the power of everybody doing the bookkeeping to figure out what's the best possible thing. You know, the computer, only thing they can do is check statistics, right? If most people are doing this, it's probably that. And that's kind of how it works. And I'll show you how to turn that off and the implications of that. On the vendor payee side, you want to select a payee from your customer vendor list and you always want to select a, a payee. Look, I have clients that tell me, Hector, I don't want to create every restaurant that's there. You know, I'll just leave it blank. I don't want to create every gas station that's there. I'll leave it blank. My advice is don't. Always create the payee. Always create the payee. Always create the vendor. Because there are reports inside QuickBooks that allow you to summarize information based on the vendor or the payee. And then you don't get that information. You have to sort through memos. It's really bad. Plus, if you want to reclassify in batch, um, you know, you can select a payee and make all the transactions for that payee a whole different category, a whole different expense if you made a mistake. So my recommendation is always, always, always create the vendor or payee. QuickBooks Online doesn't have a limit on how many payees you can have uh, inside this database. So who cares, right? If you want to get rid of it later, you make it inactive. But don't skip the payee feature, please, right? It's coming from a very experienced person, I'm telling you. Now, there's a part that you don't see, which is customer project class and locations. You will see that if you have it turned on. So if you have, um, if you have QuickBooks Online Plus or Advanced and you turn on uh, job costing or you turn on classes or you turn on locations, you're going to see all those options in there. They're hidden now for this presentation. We'll leave them out to uh, kind of lower the confusion level. And lastly, in the bottom, you want to look at a couple of things. One, the memo that comes from the, from the bank. My suggestion is to always, always copy the bank memo, right? Don't turn that feature off. Always, always copy the bank memo. And I'll show you how to turn that feature off and on. The original bank memo, the one that you can't edit, the one that actually came to the bank, will also be stated there where it says bank detail. So if you accidentally delete the memo, you can always copy and paste it from there. That's great. I love the fact that it kind of keeps that information there uh, read only. And then notice on the right side, that there's two add buttons, right? There's a add in the top and add in the bottom. So they actually do the same. The difference is the add in the top is really meant for you to accept QuickBooks Online's automatic categorization. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and the one on the button, the bottom is there for you to accept it after you've entered the payee, the category, after you checked it. Now, Couple other things I want to mention. There's a button that says create rule from this transaction. We'll talk about this when we move into uh, rules. And uh, you can also add an attachment on the fly. That's pretty awesome. So you can do it straight from here uh, without having to open the whole transaction and add it there. And there's also a split feature. The split feature is really designed for you to do two categories, two expense categories, or two accounts on one transaction. Um, two is the default, but if you click on add lines, you can add more and more as you go. So if you got one transaction that has, let's say, principal, interest, and late fee, then you can split it up into three, three lines. And there's no, I haven't tested the limits of this screen. I'm going to guess 10, but I really don't know what the limits of this screen is.
Now, you will notice, and this is fairly new, probably from about two months ago, QuickBooks now has this thing called suggested rules. And the way it basically works is if you select a category vendor, if you select a, a transaction with a vendor and a payee twice, you, and QuickBooks detects it to be essentially the same thing, it will detect a pattern and pop up and say, hey, we should create a rule. And, and, and you do want to create rules because if you don't create rules, then you let QuickBooks auto categorization do the work for you. And you really can't change or edit the auto categorization from QuickBooks. You can only change and edit the rules. That's why I think it's important for you to create as many rules as possible. Now, within the rule creation, there's an option to make rules automatic or the auto add rules. We'll talk about that during the second half where we talk about rules. That, that's something that you may want to think about it. Some accountants uh, hate it. Some accountants love it. We'll, we'll see. Then you, you get three options at the bottom. One is don't show this again, not now, and create rule. So not now means ignore the window but allow suggested rules to keep functioning in the future. Don't show this, don't show me again, turns off out of rule suggestion. And I'll show you how to turn that back on. And create rule moves you to the rule screen. So we'll, we'll wait until we do the demo to talk about that. Now, on the baby gear, on the small gear, on the right-hand side of bank feeds, there's four important preferences that you want to look at. One is an edit, editable date field. I never turn that one on because the date that cleared through the bank is the date that I want there. I don't want to change the date that I cleared through the bank. There are some use cases and why you would do that. There's copy bank detail to memo. Always turn that on because if you select the wrong vendor, the wrong payee, and you have no memo, and then you want to reclassify it or verify it later, you have no context. All you have is a date and a dollar amount, right? So you always want to copy the bank detail memo because that gives you context. It helps you recategorize, helps you double check your work. You see that the one option says show suggested rules. That's when you turn it off by clicking on don't, don't show this again. You can just basically hit the checkbox again and that turns the feature back on. And the last one that says show bank details. Now this one is not really well explained in my opinion, so I'll attempt to explain it. QuickBooks Online has this artificial intelligence way to clean up bank details. Uh, I'll, we'll get a little bit more into that uh, uh, soon. But if you click on show bank details, it turns off the feature. And then in the bank feed screen, the only thing you see is the real data that came from the bank, not QuickBooks's cleaned up version. Okay. Again, depending on the type of transactions that you have and the type of client, the type of vendors that you deal with, in many, many cases, QBO does it right. The cleanup is really, really good very understandable, but in many cases, it's also butchered. So since I'm not 100% confident on it, I just turn it off and I use the bank, so I click on, I hit the checkbox and I click on show bank details. So we'll explain that um, uh, soon. Now, QuickBooks Online by default does auto categorization where it attempts to guess which is the right uh, category or, or bank account, or I'm sorry, the category or expense account to categorize a transaction too. By default, you, you cannot turn this off. It's one of, the th one of my pet peeves. You cannot uh, turn this off, right? QuickBooks by default will give a category. So if you're a novice user or a person that just doesn't care, you'll just click select all and accept everything as is, and you let QuickBooks do a PNL, you know, out of their own, out of its own AI. And it's gonna be wrong, but um, it's really up to you. you you're gonna decide at the end, you know, how you want to work. But I, you can turn it off. So, and in some cases, they get it right. Um, so you want to keep in mind how that information comes about. So that information comes about in three ways. Our categorization looks at your chart of accounts, and it actually looks at the name of the account. It looks at the detail type. That's a big one. So before, detail type was something that was completely useless and inconsequential. If anything, the detail type was a big nuance, like a nuisance. I mean, it was one of those things that it's like forced you to select something, but it, it, it had no impact on the financial statements. Now what QuickBooks is doing is they're reading all their QuickBooks files, their metadata. They're seeing what other people are doing in terms of categorizing stuff. And they're triangulating what other people have done in the past, the name of your account, your detail type. 
to do the auto categorization. So, and then, and then once, obviously, once you create the rules, that's a different story. It will be based on your rules, but a brand new file that has no rules, the auto categorization com comes from that. So that's something valuable to kind of keep, keep in mind. Now, a couple other little things, you know, terminology, you're going to see some categories uh, uh, sort of green. You're going to see sort of a faint green color. That means that QuickBooks is making a more educated guess based on the past. And I'll show you kind of how that works. You're going to see a match. Match means, hey, QuickBooks thinks that this transaction is attached to a different transaction that was already created in QuickBooks. And then you can see a rule. Rule means that there's an actual explicit rule that you created maybe manually or auto-suggested. And that's the basis that QuickBooks is using to do categorization. In order of priority, QuickBooks Online will always look to the rule first. It will look for the match second and then the green categorization third. So that would be the order. And the green categorization, like I said, it's, it's educated best guess based on past entries of your own QuickBooks file. Again, if, let me go back to this. If this is black, this is out of categorization based on the aggregate data AI. If it's green, it's out of categorization based on your own behavior. Rule is based on an explicit rule that we created, which we'll discuss. And then match means it's trying to match it to something else that's already in the books. Okay, <laughs> a little bit more terminology and, and, and then we'll jump into the product. I think this, yeah, this is the last one before we jump into the product. So we have for review in QuickBooks excluded and deleted. So for review are all the transactions were downloaded from the, from the bank and they're waiting for you to take action to either add it, match it, or create it as a transfer. In QuickBooks means they've already been added into QuickBooks or matched into QuickBooks from the review screen. And the reason why they're in the in QuickBooks section is because if you want to undo it, you can undo it. So you have the option to do that. So that we'll call that uh, not really limbo, but that's like sort of potential limbo if you want to undo it. Excluded means I remove them from the list for whatever reason, and then I can permanently delete them or I can undo it and send it back to for review. So we'll cover that sort of on the back end of the webinar. All right, so let me switch over to the in product. I already preloaded my own chart of accounts. Uh, I already have, I have my chart of accounts in Excel that I use for all my clients. Um, and for me, it's just really important to have a chart of accounts that I'm familiar with. I understand uh, the QuickBooks default chart of accounts has got, it's, it's too weak basically, in, in my opinion. And then what happens is it, it becomes counterproductive to me to try to do the, the work fast. So I, you always should have your own chart of accounts trust each other accounts that you use for all your, all your clients. I have my own and actually sell it too. Um, well, actually, I don't want to get into it, but <laughs> I use my own chart of accounts. Let's so just leave it there. And I'm going to go into uh, banking now. And then a couple of things. So in the banking screen, usually when I'm in this screen, I need as much real estate as possible to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the three little lines uh, next to the, next to the QuickBooks logo to, collapse and get rid of the left navigation bar. That left navigation bar is nothing but noise. So I'm going to get rid of that because I, I need as much space as possible. You're also going to notice that there's a, a little tiny arrow or a carrot pointing up on top of the sort of the main table where the transactions are. I click on that uh, to minimize the number of connected accounts that are being visible. The difference is if I have it open, you're going to see these big cards or big squares for you to switch and swap through all the accounts. Um, when I collapse that, then I have to click the drop down menu to swap through accounts. So I have two credit cards and two bank accounts in here, and I have to use the drop down menu to switch uh, across accounts. So that's only the only thing. But again, I'm trying to look for as much real estate as possible once I'm on the screen. Now, I'm gonna click X on whatever this is, right? I don't, I don't little warning message. I'll click X on that. And then I'm going to click Control Plus or Control Minus. In Mac would be Command Plus and Command Minus. So if I want to zoom in and zoom out, okay? So this would be personal preference. You want to do zoom in and zoom out based on personal preference. Again, you want to, it's all about efficiency, right? You want to be as efficient, if, as efficient as possible. We want to cut uh, work time. So you want to zoom in and zoom out so it's, it's at the perfect situation. The other thing is here on the gear menu, and I mentioned this during the slides, you got the four preferences we talked about, uh, copy bank detail to memo, show suggested rules, and show bank detail. Notice that if I uncheck 
show bank detail, the payees, and I just want you to kind of pay attention to the payee names, they're very short, very clean, okay? Uh, let me sort this by date so we get a kind of a mixture of it. So you see it right there? And then if I click on the gear menu and then click on show bank details, I'm gonna get much longer, sort of rougher, more raw data type of payees. I actually like the raw data, okay? So that will require me to expand this column uh, quite a bit, which, which might require me to zoom in or zoom out to make more space. That's why I make emphasis on zooming in and zooming out, okay? So that's, uh, that's show bank details. Um, there, there are a couple of other things is here in the gear menu where it says rows. You can limit this to 50, expand it all the way to 300 if you wanna see a couple at a time. That's up to you, you would have to sort of figure out what's the sweet spot. I like to show as many as possible, so I showed 300. And then I click on compact. Now what compact does is basically reduces the space between transactions. So I'm gonna click on compact, and notice I have a little bit less space. I don't need that, I have good eyes. Some people need that big space to be able to differentiate through the transaction. So this is my preferred way of working. Uh, zoomed out a little bit, compact, and condensing the accounts in the top gives me a lot more real estate uh, to work in. A couple of other things that are worth mentioning, let me switch here to like this credit card. That's worth mentioning, you're gonna see batch actions on the, on the left that would allow you to, to select a couple of things at a time and categorize them, we'll talk about that. There's filter, this is pretty cool. This is just to filter dates. So if you wanted to work on, let's say one month at a time. So I wanna work just on July, uh, 2017 to uh, July 31st of 2017, I click on apply and that limits it just to that month. A lot of people like to do one month, reconcile, one month, reconcile. That's possible. I don't, I do it the whole thing and it'll make sense. It'll be pretty evident uh, pretty soon. Then you have um, all and you have recognized. So recognized are the ones that are automatically being categorized based on rules, based on matching, based on uh, uh, past behavior. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that, okay? And then some people, depending on what version of QuickBooks Online they have, they might see here in the preferences something called remember category selection. I think QuickBooks Online is doing away with that. And depending on which version of QuickBooks you have, you may or may not see a checkbox here that says remember category selection. I think that's going away, honestly, um, because on, on all the new files, I'm not seeing that anymore. But I remember that option being here in the, in the categories. Okay, so let's do a couple of transactions so you kind of get, start getting familiar with the process. Now, you can do one by one based on dates. That's possible, okay? So you go to the first one and you make a decision on every single transaction. So for example, this is a payment to the credit card for 10,633.89. And let's say, oh, I know where that money came from. That money came from, let's say, my primary bank account. So that's all you have to do. You have to select the primary bank account and click on record transfer. Now what the transfer will do is it'll create a transaction that's only a transfer, that's only balance sheet to balance sheet. And if I screw this up, for example, this wasn't really money coming from the bank, it's income or something like that, I'm screwed. I can't do anything about it because it's a balance sheet to balance sheet transaction. This is why regardless, I would prefer to use add and then select the bank account here is the exact same effect, okay? So a transfer where you have a balance sheet account here and an add where you have a balance sheet account here is the exact same transaction. So because it makes no difference in my accounting, might as well just make it an add and avoid transfer altogether, okay? So I'm really uh, cognizant about using uh, transfer altogether. The biggest problem with using transfer, and I'll explain why, there's this thing called uncategorized asset and QuickBooks, it's famous for using this as a default suggested transaction. So when you do this and you click record transfer and then you go back and, oh, that's income, that's expense, that's something other than a balance sheet uh, transaction, then, um, then that will cause a big problem. So that uncategorized asset, to me, is sort of the biggest problem in the world. What I do is I go into the chart of accounts and this is going off tangent, I know, I'm sorry but this is what I do. I, I look for the uncategorized asset account and then I change the name to do not use or be fired, okay? So I put do not use or be fired because I can delete it. That's a protected account. 
So basically what that does is when I go back into my banking and, and somebody, you know, uses that, it says, you know, do not use or be fired. Well, you were warned, you know, that's kind of my concept. I, I think that even though you do that, I think people will still just not even read it and just click record transfer and move, uh, and, and move, move out of there. So just do that. I mean, or, or change it to something that will really bother the person, maybe call it out on categorized asset. It's kind of the worst thing that QuickBooks has ever come up with ever. Like uh, QuickBooks has come up with very bad things. They've had very bad ideas in their lifetime on categorized asset has to top it. I mean, that wins the dumb awards <laughs> of, uh, of anything that QuickBooks has ever done ever. All right, anyway, so um, I'm going to make this a, a transfer from my Chase bank account and I'll click on add. So that basically that just creates the first uh, transaction. Now I'm gonna go to the next one and do the same thing. I'll pick my vendor name. So in this case, I know that the vendor, my vendor name is Viva Smart. I actually know the name um, and I'm creating a new vendor on the fly. I'm extrapolating this from the memo. Although there's some garbage in there, that's probably like maybe PayPal or something like that that adds that. I'm the one who's gonna create the vendor and that's a manual process. QuickBooks will not automatically create vendors for you. So unfortunately, that's, you know, that's where we're kind of stuck. Okay, and then here, let's say I'm gonna call this continued education, continuing education and training. This is where knowing your chart of accounts comes into play, memorizing, using the same chart of accounts for all your clients. It's a really important thing. So, um, so we'll do that. So we'll click on add. So that's just doing one by one, right? So I'm gonna come up here. I'm gonna call this uh, QuickBooks software because I bought some software from QuickBooks. Go to add, save, I created the vendor. Select the category, not the shabby. <laughs> you actually got this one right. Um, and then I click on add. So that's kind of like doing what doing one by one uh, does. Let's do here, zoom, I'll just do here. zoom, add, and you got this one right too. See, computer supplies and softwares. So the categorization, Hasn't been bad so far. Look at this one, MailChimp. That's actually marketing. They got this, they got this one right too. So that's pretty, it's, it's getting really good. I mean, it's just getting, let's say uh, just, I'll just be, you know, we'll call it social media marketing instead. But uh, the auto categorization is getting really, really good, really scary and how, how good is it doing? And it's really, it's gonna be very telling about where a profession is going in the future when software can do all this stuff. Now, the other thing that you can do, and this is, when you do one by one, this is what happens. But I personally like doing them in batch or doing them in groups. So I'm gonna click on bank detail basically to sort by name. And what I'll do is I'll do a whole bunch at a time. So I'll go to 7-Eleven, select, the, create the vendor, right? So I already had this in there, 7-Eleven vendor, select the category and then click on add. And then I'll do the next one, 7-Eleven category, click on add. And the reason why I wanna do them like this is because when you're, when you're using repeating vendors and you're using patterns, QuickBooks will now start to, um, to uh, you are going to be uh, faster, but QuickBooks will start automatically suggesting. So as I mentioned earlier, here on the, on the gear menu on the right, there's this option here called suggested rules. If you turn that on, and then I start categorizing. So look at all these Amazon payments. So I'm going to click on Amazon, uh, type Amazon, and then click on add and click on save. And then let's say we're going to make this, uh, software, okay, computer supplies and software, and then I'll click on add, so that was one. I'm gonna go to the next one, do the same thing, Amazon, and then we'll make the software, so I'm doing two. You will notice that as soon as I do two, and I click on add, cross my fingers, there you go, suggested rule pops up. Now Quick, QuickBooks says, oh, you've done two transactions for the same vendor, the same category, I'm starting to sense a pattern here, should I create a rule? This is where you say absolutely, create the rule. So I'm gonna click on create rule. So now the rule is created. So what's significantly different is that now this will show green because it's using the past pattern and it will say rule really loud, really clear there that this is not a guess from QuickBooks. This is based on patterns. So it's using patterns to categorize. If I click on it, I still have the ability to change it if I want to. So I could change one, I could change this one. Let's say this one was office supplies and I click on save but it doesn't modify my rule. So the, the nice thing about the rule is you can manage your exceptions one by one, but the rule will always take over and be the automatic account suggested. If I don't use the rules and I start changing the categories, 
QuickBooks will also create, uh, change the categories as you go. So let's take a look at, let's go, I spent a lot of money on Amazon, obviously. Let's go here to American Airlines. So I'm gonna go here, American Airlines. Go to add vendor. And then see, you got this one wrong. Somehow I figured that this was mileage reimbursement. Hey, it's not always perfect. So let's go to, let's change that to travel. Okay, travel expense, airfare. And then I'm gonna click on save. And I'm gonna go to the next one, American Airlines. Let's do airfare and save. And then it's asking me to do an auto suggest rule. If I ignore it and click not now, then it just defaults back to what QuickBooks keeps thinking what it is. Um, so at some point it should start, um, it should start suggesting airfare, but it's not. So at this point, I think it's worth it to do, um, to do a, a, an explicit rule in this case. Let me do it one more time. It's not suggesting it. So let's do an explicit rule. Let's do a manual explicit rule. So I'm going to come in here. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know what? There really should be a rule for this. QuickBooks is not suggesting it from so for some crazy reason. Let me do it manually. So I'm going to type here American Airlines. I'm going to pick here, uh, what was it? Uh, travel, airfare. And then I'm going to click down here where it says create rule from this transaction. So this is the same thing as the auto suggest. But in case I'm actually clicking on it, I'm actually initiating, uh, I'm, I'm initiating it. So I'm gonna click on create rule from this transaction and it opens up my rule screen. Now, I don't wanna get too deep into this because I'm gonna go back into this in a different area of, of the presentation. Uh, but let me just do one real quick. So I'm gonna call this one American Airlines. The rule name doesn't matter. So I'm just gonna choose AI in this case. The rule name is just internal information, but here this is really important. Notice that the rule is using what's called all conditions. So it's using a combination. Hey, if it's $25 and if it's American Airlines, those two things together, then reclassify it. I can delete one of the conditions if I want to, just to make American Airlines the only one. Or maybe I can go to at line and do an or or an any, and then say, hey, if, if you see American AI, because sometimes the vendor will say American AI or American, I'll, I'll do one more, American Air. So it really depends on the, on the patterns. You will see, you will know based on your bank statements what it's called. So you can do up to five, uh, any rule saying, hey, if you see in the text, any of these five, automatically make it American Airlines and automatically make it airfare. Memo, leave the memo blank, always on rules, leave the memo blank. If you put something in the memo, it gets rid of the original bank memo. If you leave it blank, it will still bring the original bank memo. So that's gold. So you wanna leave the memo blank always on rules unless you have some specific circumstance. I'm gonna click on save. So, so I created the rule straight from here. So now I'm gonna see rule, okay? Now if I wanna separate transactions that have been recognized by the rules versus the ones that were not, the ones you see in black here, not in green, I can click on the recognize button and it will filter and only show me the ones that are recognized. Now, why is it important to do that? Because maybe I got 81 transactions here and I basically just scroll down real quick saying, Amazon, 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 okay, that looks good. Amazon looks good. Okay, American Airlines, that looks good. So usually what you do when you get into these situations, you just click on select all, that's a little box to the left of date. You click on select all there and then you click on batch actions and accept. And what that will do is it will accept only the ones that were recognized through the rules. That's a beautiful thing. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, for some reason, okay, that, now it reset it back to zero. Okay. Uh, these were not accepted for some reason. Let me select these and go to accept. Maybe they were on the second page or something, whatever. So I'm going to go back into all. And that's really the dynamic of how we add transactions into QuickBooks. So we have the, we have the, um, uh, the transactions that we add one by one. We have the transactions that we create rules for. We can ignore the rulemaking process and we can accept our rules in batch. Okay, I need a five minute break, maybe a three minute break to breathe. So let me run a polling question here. And let's do polling question number three. Launch the poll, just give me an honest answer. Let's me know what I should do in terms of my pace. These webinars, uh, they start uh, slow a little bit because we have to go through some concepts. We have to get people get people to log out that 
are not interested in the topic. You know, we have to get some terminology in and then time just flies and we just go really deep into content. So that's why it kind of starts slow and then it goes uh, fast. Um, so again, I don't do, I don't do active Q and A during this session, just because I have my content pre-planned and I have my slides and all that stuff. If you have uh, any questions for me, just log in into the members only Q and A session at 3 PM Eastern. I'll send you a link about 10 minutes, five minutes before, right after I'm done on how to log in. And then we'll, we'll go over the, anything that I didn't cover, any questions you want to ask me, maybe some advanced tips and tricks, let me know. And we'll, we'll talk about that during the Q and A. Okay, let's see, uh, where are we here? Okay, so the polling question's up. Just answer that polling question for me, please. Uh, how's the speed? Too slow, too fast, just right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and click on end poll. And I'll share it. I think it's just fun to share it, right? So 5% of you think it's too fast, 3% thinks it's too slow, 93 just right. Hey, what can I do? <laughs> All right, uh, I will answer this question real quick because I kind of skipped through this a little bit. How do you upload your own chart of accounts? You go to, uh, chart, you go to into uh, chart of accounts and then you click up here in the new button, you click on import and then you select your chart of accounts. I have mine in, in uh, somewhere here in my desktop. Here's uh, where is it? I had it somewhere, but there it is. Select that, click on open, click on next. You have to select the fields, click on next, import, and it'll import all the accounts for you. Now, the one of the sort of requirements is that you have already a chart of accounts in Excel, and probably, possibly, you also have one that it's importable because. You can't just have a, a, a spreadsheet that's randomly formatted and you are expecting that to upload. You have to work on your template. You have to have a template uh, that works. So, I mean, you can email me if you want to know more about that. I have sort of my own chart of accounts that I have. And I, I, I well, it's, it's, if you're a member, it's in the portal, so you can download that. But if you're not, you can email me and I can show you how you can, you can get that chart of accounts. Anyway, going back into banking, so actually, let me switch to the slides real quick because I haven't done slides in a while. Let's do slides and that will allow me kind of know what's next coming here in the pipe. So we're going to talk about bank rules now, one of my favorite things. We'll do rules and then we'll do matching. So um, some of the important terminology. In QuickBooks, there's money in, which means transactions that are deposits, ACH or credit card credits, because it's going to be universal for whether it's a bank or a credit card. And then there's money out, uh, bank debits, checks, credit cards, expenses, ACH out, wire out, that sort of thing. The reason why this is important because QuickBooks Online can only create rules within the context of money coming out or within the context of money coming in. So you have a, have a, vendor, you have a vendor that brings money out and in on the same category. You still have to create two separate rules for that one vendor, even if the transactions look identical. As I mentioned earlier, you have up to five conditions you can create. They can be all, what is called that all or none, um, all or none um, conditions. So all will require all the conditions to be true. Any will require any of them to be true. And you also have the amount. So, and I'll show you some practical examples of how amount uh, would work, okay? The next uh, concept here is we have uh, the transaction types. So if it's money out, it's gonna be an expense, a check, or a transfer. If it's a credit card, it's gonna be an expense because the expense is the QuickBooks transaction for credit card uh, expenses or charges. If it's money in, it's gonna be a deposit, a credit card credit, or a transfer. There's some exceptions here, like if you're using a uh, journal entry or something like that, but that's really not that common when you're doing banking. Uh, payee is gonna be a vendor or a customer, an employee as well, but typically employees is for paychecks. Account or category basically means chart of accounts. Class or location, you can automate, automate those. And as I mentioned earlier, for the memo, leave the memo blank always so it doesn't override the bank's uh, memo. There's no way to append it, it only overrides. And the option to automatically add to the books, and we'll talk about that, is 
if you select this option, th what the rule will do is it will skip the process of you clicking add, it will skip the review process and go straight into the register. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's really up to you. Um, I love it. it, it just brings me closer to automation. And also you can import and export the rules from one QuickBooks Online company to the other. Caveat, if you have a different chart of accounts in both <laughs> QuickBooks Online files, it's not gonna work. So you have to use the same chart of accounts to be able to import and export the rules. And obviously the same vendor list, at least the same vendor list. So typically if you have an awesome client that everything's being cleaned up, the rules are beautiful, the vendor list is great, export the vendor list, export the chart of accounts, export the rules and import them, chart of accounts, vendor, and then the rules. And you'll be able to start replicating this into somebody else's uh, QuickBooks file. Okay, so let's go into rules. Okay, before we go into matching, let me switch uh, screens again. Back to QuickBooks Online. Let's go to rules. So I'm going to click on the rules tab. So next to banking on the top, you see the rules tab. And basically, all the rules that you are creating will be uh, added here. The difference between a manually created rule, like the one we did for American Airlines, I'm gonna click on edit so you can see it, it uh, and the one that's automatically suggested, is that the one that's automatically suggested just adds the words suggested. Uh, that's really all it is, it adds the word suggested, so you know it's been automatically uh, suggested. So that, that actually helps. If you actually come here and you edit it, and you remove suggested from it, okay? So let's say, for example, you wanted to go through a sort of verification process, to make sure the suggested rules are, let's say, verified and audited, and this is beautiful now. So what you wanna do is you wanna remove a suggested, click on save, and then once you go into your workflow, you look at this and you're like, okay, that's no longer one that's pending for me to review, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, somebody's asking how long is this webinar? It's two hours, so it should end around 2.50, 2.50 p.m. Eastern, uh, closer to three, but uh, we have another webinar at three. Okay, so these are the rules here, and, um, and these are the ones that have already been created. Now, under batch actions, is basically you can delete them. So if you want to delete the rules, you click on delete. Now, let me show you something else real quick. Let me go into banking, and let me, um, so I needed to breathe for a second. Um, let me show you something. Let's say, for example, we got these transactions these Google transactions, and we're looking at them here. Google storage. So I'm gonna come in here, and I'm just gonna copy the, the memo here. I'm gonna go into rules, but what I'll do is I'm gonna hit control copy on rules, so it opens up in a separate tab, so I have it into two tabs. And I'm gonna go to create rule, and I'm gonna create a rule for Google. So Google storage, so I'm gonna say bank text. If it says Google storage, so I'm only using a portion of it, so if, it's, if it says Google storage in the bank text, right, I'm gonna, uh, I just need one line. Let's make the payee Google, which I had to create it because it wasn't there already. And then let's make this office supplies. Office supplies and software, okay? So I'm saying this is the rule name, which is inconsequential, it's just internal information, okay? Uh, bank text, it's the text that's coming through the bank. I'm typing it in here. I'm telling it which is the, uh, payee and I'm telling it which is the category and I'm not doing the auto add I'm doing the manual review and I'm gonna click on save once I do this my rule has been set up I go back into banking and then I should see now my my Google be automatically uh, selected now what happens if there's more than one Google thing there's Google storage Google apps Google whatever else we're gonna have multiple rules for Google let me see if that's even a thing in my in my uh, credit card here. I don't remember. This is actually my actual credit cards. There's a lot of things in here. Let me see if there's anything else under the word Google. Okay, now, it's all Google storage. So this is not uh, the best example here. It's all Google storage, but we can find a vendor that has multiple. Okay, this is a good example here. Um, actually, this is the best example. Let's do Home Depot. Notice that there's uh, two Home Depots here. Home Depot 201 and Home Depot uh, 6326. Now, those store numbers, those are store numbers, they might be contextual. So for example, business owner says, hey, by the way, there's a Home Depot next to my office. That's Home Depot 6326. And you can search them, you can Google Home Depot 6326 and I'll give you the address. That one is business. If you see anything coming out of the Home Depot, that's business, that's materials, that's office supplies, repairs and maintenance, whatever. But if you see one that says 209, 
that's personal. Okay, so then you have to create two separate Home Depot rules in this case. So let's leave it here. Let me go into rules here and go to add new. So we'll do Home Depot 209. And I'll copy the rule name into the description. Again, the rule name is just internal information. And then I'm going to go to payee, put Home Depot. And let's say that he said the 209 was personal. So I'm going to go to category. Let me go to personal. And I have my chart of accounts contains all personal stuff here too. So it makes it really easy. So I think this is like personal purchases, for example. Or there's all other things like uh, uh, per personal stuff for the house. I already have an equity account, pretty extensive equity account for all personal stuff. So let's say Home Depot 209, it's personal. I'm going to click on save. So that rule is there when I go into... Uh, here, I'm going to click on refresh and let's go down to uh, maybe second page. Okay, so, second, right, so there you go. So notice that only one of them have a rule. See, so this says, okay, this Home Depot 29 has a rule. Now the other ones, QuickBooks is already out of suggesting the payee because again, it's AI is saying, okay, this might be the same payee and I'm not going to change the vendor name, I'm just going to change the category. Notice that the 6326 are still going to reimbursable expenses. So I'm going to create a separate rule for that. So I'm going to go back into rules and I'm going to click on the edit button and click on copy. You can duplicate rules, which is a beautiful thing. So I'm going to click on copy here and we're going to do Home Depot. What's the other store number? 6326. So 6326. And I'll put it here. 6326. And then this is going to be repairs and maintenance same same vendor okay same vendor but now it's a different category repairs and maintenance same vendor different category that's okay so i can have the same vendor different category i don't need to mix vendors in this case i don't need to create two separate vendors under the old system you have to have a different vendor name if you want them to work differently this rules actually allows the same vendor to have two different things all together so i'm going to click on save and then I'll go back into uh, banking here and I'll click on refresh. And just have to go forward one page and let's find Home Depot. And there it is. See, this right here has it. Now, for some reason, this one didn't pick it up. That's curious. Check that out. That's weird. That's, an, that's a weird anomaly. This middle one. Oh, no, actually, that's not weird. This one's money in. That actually plays into the example I was telling you earlier. So, the money in rules and the money out rules are different. This is why uh, it didn't pick this one up. It's a great example here. So if I wanted to pick this one up as well, I got to go into my rules. I have to look at the 6326, copy it, okay? And change this to a money in rule. And that's what makes a lot of sense there. And notice the transaction type is different now. And then on the rule name, I'll just add uh, money in. There's usually a lot less money in rules the money out rules, by the way, uh, maybe, it depends. Um, and then I'm gonna go into uh, category, I'm gonna keep it the same, because that's basically a refund, right? I, I bought something and I return it, and it should go to the same category. So I'll click on save. And I go back into here, I'm gonna click on refresh. We'll go to the same motions here, and see if everything has been picked up by the rules. Okay, there you go. See, now everything has been picked up on the rules, in and out category beautiful so at this point i could select one hold the shift key and select the last one and select them all in groups and click on batch actions accept selected or i can click on recognized and then click here select all batch actions accept selected so because recognize is only going to be uh, putting things that have been done by the rules so I can batch them in uh, the recognize screen as well. So there's two ways to batch accept uh, those. Okay. So those are, those are those rules. Let's do a different set of rules here. Let's look, let's look at this one right here. Anthony's coal fired pizza. Okay. I go to this restaurant a lot. And let's say for example, that I uh, tell uh, the, the business owner tells it, the, the accountant, look, if you see anything there under $75, it's going to be personal. If you see anything there over $75, it's going to be business. So this is going to be a numerical rule. So with this Anthony's called five pizza, what I can do is I can start with one. So I'll start with the first one and I'll do here Anthony's. 
Okay, I don't have to make the vendor uh, verbatim. I'm just having the vendor name here, Anthony's. And then this is gonna be, we said under 75 is personal. So let's do personal meals. Uh, is that even in a category? Meals while traveling, meals. Let's do personal. Uh, let's do, I probably should have a personal meals in there. Oh, restaurants right here. Restaurants, personal expense, okay? Um, so I'm gonna click on uh, create rule from this transaction. So I'm doing it from here. And then I'm gonna come up here, it says amount. I'm gonna do instead of equals, less than. And then at this point I'll do 70, uh, no, $75, exactly. Less than $75, make it personal. We'll call this Anthony's less than 75, okay? And then I'll make this rule, hit save. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back into my rules. Hit refresh here. There's Anthony's, I'm gonna click on the drop down menu and click on copy. And then we'll make this Anthony's more than $75. At this point, I actually don't need to do uh, any dollar amount whatsoever because it will catch everything else. And we'll make this meals with four clients and events. Meals for clients and events. There you go. So I don't actually need to put a numerical dollar value in this one because by default, it will pick this one up. So I'll show you how that works. And I click on save. So notice I have both rules here, less than and more than. If you remember, the more than uh, didn't have any numerical value. So if I click, if I'm going to click the drop down and, and, and push it up, this is called prioritization of rules. So if I make the more than 75, Actually, let me, I'm going to edit that. I'm going to do Anthony's all, make it easier. Okay. I'm going to call it Anthony's catch all, make it just easier to understand. So all my Anthony's of every dollar value will go into uh, that expense category. I'm going to go back into bank, hit refresh and see what happens. So they're all going into meals for clients. Let me expand this. Collapse that and expand this. Okay, notice everything is going to meals for clients. Okay, even though there are some here under $75. The reason for that is because of prior to prioritization. That's a tough one for me. So the, the reason for that is because in here, let me zoom this in a little bit. In here, I'm putting the catch-all on top of the one that's less than $75. I would have to make the one less than $75 a bigger priority on top of the catch all. So it catches that first before doing any categorization. So it's just changing the order, literally just changing the order here. So I'm going to go back into uh, bank credits and then click on uh, uh, refresh. And then once I go down into Anthony's, there you go. There's the mixture. You see that? So we see some things, this 3947 is going into uh, owner's personal expenses. And the 61 and the other ones are going into advertising and promotion, meals for, uh, what was it? Uh, meals for events and clients. So I'm gonna click on recognize, select all, batch actions, accept. Beautiful thing. I mean, if this doesn't get you excited, you have no soul. Anyway, um, so let's do a couple of more batching all within the, 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 the context of doing things in batch without necessarily creating rules. So for example, this, is a, this one here is called AMC, Western AMC Online. This is movie theater. So this is personal use. So I don't have to necessarily create a rule to do things in batch. I can select one of them and then I can hold shift and select the last one that will select a whole bunch in a group. I can go to batch actions. I can click on modify selected and under payee, I'm going to call this AMC, whatever it is, right? AMC movies. Okay. And then I click on save. And then on the categories, we'll do uh, personal, whatever, right? So personal, let's do sort of my default one here, all other personal expenses. And then I click on apply. What this will do is it will automatically move all those in batch to that vendor, to that category. I go to batch actions, accept. 
So I can do it in batch, but it won't create the rule. So if it shows up again, I still have to do something with it. Let's do an example of that. Let's look at this one. This one here called arepas. Okay. Actually, this might be a good example. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it to, um, let me refresh here for a second. I'm going to show you something. So this is the actual name of, of, of the restaurant. It's called arepas. And it has SQ in front of it, which means it's square. It was a square POS system. If I click on the gear menu, and I don't know why the gear menu is not wanting to function. Come on, gear menu. Let me uh, put this back at 100%. Refresh one more time. Yeah, so the, oh, there it is. Okay, the gear menu is working now. So if I, ch if I take out show bank details, notice that what QuickBooks will do now is completely change. Look, it's changing the name of my vendor. It took out the apostrophe S. Now, I don't know if that's any context, but it, it changes things. But Arepa is the name of a food. Like I don't know. The, the name of the restaurant is actually Arepas with an apostrophe S. So this is some of the, I mean, I'm, I'm ranting at this point, but, um, but it's one of the things I hate about the, the cleanup process is that it, it, could, it could significantly change uh, the name of some of these vendors. Now for the ones that, like most of these look good, but it, it just happens to me, like this, this is probably a good example. Oh, no, it's a crappy vendor's name anyway. Um, but I think, I think it's getting better, but I'll, I'll rant to say that I, I don't want QuickBooks to change it for me. So I'm going to do show bank details and I want the raw data from the bank anyway. So I'm going to show you this. I'm going to select maybe four of them and I'll, I'll leave two open here. So I'll leave the last two open. So I'll like, and I'm going to go to modify selection. Pay ye, I'm going to put Arepas Grill, whatever the name of the restaurant is. And we're going to call this meals with meals while traveling, whatever. And I click on apply. So, and I'm all four of them doing them in one shot. I'm going to click on batch actions and click on accept. Now QuickBooks learns, notice that it just learned that it should be a different category. So it, it recategorized the other ones, but it didn't create a rule and it didn't batch them. And it didn't even do the vendor. Uh, so I would have to literally do one for it to catch the vendor. So if I, after I do one and complete one, not with the batching by itself, then it will pick up or it should pick up the vendor's name for the other one. I guess it didn't do it this time, but um, that's basically the difference between doing it like that with the batching versus uh, the rules. So that's, I mean, that's batching and rules are things that people get uh, mixed up uh, quite a bit. So that's why uh, those things are important to mention. Okay, what else do we have in rules? Uh, the, uh, uh, automatic, okay. So let's see what else we would do automatic. Let's go to uh, maybe Starbucks. Let me go into, oh, let's do it easier, gas station. So for example, under no circumstance, ExxonMobil would ever be a personal expense. I, I never need to look at it. It's always gonna be a specific dollar amount you know, or, or, or a dollar range or something like that. Um, so I really don't have to worry about it too much. I can make all these things automatic. So ExxonMobil, I think it's a good one. So I'm going to go to ExxonMobil and I'm going to copy this memo, put, paste it here in the vendor and then go to add, save. That's a little bit of a shortcut. You know, so it's a bit of a shortcut, copy and paste there. And then we'll make this auto and fuel. But then I'm going to go to create rule from this transaction. And I'm just going to say, look, as long as the amount is less than, let's say $120, I'm pretty confident that this uh, ExxonMobil is going to be uh, a gas type of transaction. So I, I usually do these, these type of thresholds, like a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, that sort of thing, depending on the context, of course. And then I'm going to go to auto categorize, auto add. This is the one thing that makes some accountants poop their pants. Okay. This, what this does is skips the process of accepting anything and it goes straight into the bank register. Okay. At first, there used to be a lot of pushback. Accountants were like, no way ever I would do this. And I'm seeing more and more people using it because some vendors are the same thing over and over. Some payees are the same transaction essentially over and over. So is there really any need to like sit there and click accept, you know? So I'm gonna do auto categorize and then click on save. And you will notice that now you have to notice this before it goes away. It says 10 transactions were added and that was really quick. Maybe you, you missed it. 10 transactions were added automatically. When I go down and look for ExxonMobil, 
let's look for my E's. My E's are not there anymore. Let's do the same thing with Chevron. Look, I got Chevron here. I got Chevron here. I'll do the same thing with Chevron. Look at all the Chevrons that I have. By the way, sometimes I think that we, we, we uh, work for the gas companies. <laughs> when I look at these, uh, all, all these expense categories, it's always like so much money goes to gas company. Anyway, off my rent. So I'm going to go here and click on copy. And I'm going to call this one, what was it? Chevron. Chevron. And we'll do here Chevron against under $120, payee Chevron. At this point, some people have told me, Hector, I don't create a vendor for each gas station. I actually just create a vendor called gas station. I'm okay with that. I'm actually okay. I'm okay with having a generic one that says uh, Chevron or a generic one that says, I'm sorry, a generic one that says gas station, generic one that says restaurant. I'm okay with that if I keep my memo and I'm able to see it through the memo. But in this case, I'm doing two separate ones. So I'm gonna click on save. And uh, whoops, I messed up. I didn't do the automatic, but we'll go back in and take a look at that. So if I go back into the banking side, it's going to the banking, I click on refresh. They're still gonna show, they still should show there as rules. Uh, let's see. Where are you? Oh no, I didn't because it was it was it was a duplicate. So yes, this was a, a duplicate. Let me go back into rules here. This was a um, this was also set up for automatic. So notice that in this column here that says auto add, you will see that little logo there that's letting you know that these two are designed to be automatically added. That means that the behavior you expect from it, it's automatically adding it. That means that they're already on the register. They're already in the PL, right? So if I go to I'm gonna go into reports and I go into profit and loss and I'll do here all dates and I click on reports. Under fuel and gas, they're already there. They're showing there, they're gonna be there. So I'm gonna click on that 1500, the total. And there's all my Chevron, all my ExxonMobil. All of these were added automatically. I didn't click on accept. This automatic, this came in in directly from the bank into QuickBooks. I didn't even see it as an accountant, as the, as the QuickBooks user. It went straight into the register. Now, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? It's up to you to determine. But, but if, I go into, um, if I go into banking and then I go into reviewed, notice that this will give me a list of all the things that were added into QuickBooks. Uh, from the bank feeds, everything that's in there, right? And it will tell you here under what circumstance it was added. So was it a rule and, or was it an automatic rule? You can't appreciate it here. Let me zoom out maybe or zoom in. Yeah, you can't appreciate it for some reason in this screen. Maybe there's too much information, but you will notice that there's a little tiny, it's like a little logo um, next to it. So two little squares. That little logo tells you it's an automatic, it was automatically added. Okay, let me just, uh, why does it, what it doesn't it show? I don't know what's going on with my QBO today, but uh, normally that's a, just a little bit better displayed there uh, for you to see it. But that basically lets you know it is a rule, but it's an automatically added rule. Now, if you are disappointed with one of these, you're like, you know what, this is really not what I wanted. Um, I, I can just individually manually go into undo and send this one back into the, uh, in for your review. So I'm gonna click on undo, and I'm gonna click okay. That's gonna send it back to for your review. If I wanna undo a whole bunch of them, I click on bank detail, and I select, for example, all my chevrons, I'm gonna do it with all of them. Select all my chevrons. Okay, so I shift, I did a shift click, and then I go to undo, and I click on continue. So that sends stuff back, back from uh, it was already entered back into for your review. So if I go up and click on for review, I should be able to see my chevrons back in here. Okay, my chevrons are back in here. There's a rule associated with them, so they're still going to show there. But since these were reversed from an aut automatically added, they're just going to sit there. So there's no circular problem where oh you re undo them and they get re-added and undo them and get re-added. Only the new chevron transactions will get re-added. The ones that I manually undo. QuickBooks knows to wait for you to accept what you're going to do with them. So I'm going to bring them back, select them again, select them all, batch actions, and 
accept. Okay, so that's uh, that's rules in a nutshell. I don't think I missed anything on the rule side. Okay, we did the undo. So let's talk about now deleting uh, transactions from the bank feed. So let's say, for example, um, I'm going to click here on dates. Let's say, for example, I have already reconciled this bank from September on, or I already reconciled this credit card from f September 1st on. So if you already have the bank reconciled, there should be absolutely no reason why you would have transaction spending in bank feeds. They shouldn't. So if your bank is reconciled up to a specific date, you should by default automatically delete or remove every transaction that's sitting here in the for your review that is dated before that reconcile date because these are the clear dates. So to remove them, I select the first one and I scroll all the way down to the last one. Let's say it's gonna be this one from August 29th because I've already reconciled, uh, let's say, um, uh, up, up to August 31st, and I'm, I'm going to bring in September on. Let's say that's the case. So if it's already been reconciled, you want to remove every transaction as they're up to that date. Though there's only a little caveat. Credit cards tend to have a two to three day delay sometimes. So, so if you do this, you might delete one that shows up on the next month. So you may want to be careful. Sometimes what I do is maybe I'll go back a couple of days, like maybe up to here and not do these and leave those just in case they show up in September type of thing. Uh, but you get the point. You select all the ones that you want to delete. You click on batch actions and then you click on exclude. So what exclude does, it removes it from this screen. So you do nothing with them and it moves it from your review to exclude it. So if I click on the excluded tab, I can actually re review all the transactions that I have excluded. And this is limbo. So they're, they're there in limbo. So at this point, you decide what you want to do with it. So if I want to permanently delete them, I click on select all batch actions and delete. And that will completely get rid of them. You can never do anything with them again. Honestly, things inside excluded don't bother me. So I just leave them there. And if you, for whatever reason, one of these transactions shows up on the next month's uh, statement, don't enter by hand. Come in here, click on undo manually. So I'm going to undo this AICPA charge. Click on undo and then go back for your review, and then you should see it right there. So basically it's a two-step process. You exclude them, and then in the exclude, you delete them. You can always bring them back from exclude back to for your review, or you can bring them back for reviewed back to for your review if you wanna undo any of these transactions. Okay, so we did uh, everything we needed to do with, as it pertains to adding transactions, batching, and rules. Let's talk about, uh, matching and we did we did adding batch and rules now we'll do the last piece which is matching matching is one of the most complex things out there but let's cover that let me do a quick break here polling question number four polling question number four so i can drink some water and we got about 20 minutes left uh to finish this uh webinar we'll be able to cover matching uh, in 20 minutes no problem I see a lot of questions and comments in the Q and A box. Okay, I, I look at them just in case something's wrong with my with my audio or my visuals. If I see these big long questions, I typically don't answer them because these webinars are designed to be questionless, right? I'll just, I'll just I'll just jump in and maybe quickly glance at them, but don't don't expect me to answer uh, the questions live here. Just 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 no time uh, to do that. Okay. Um, there's some general comments here I think worth mentioning. Uh, one is, hey, if you get audited, you still have to have receipts just because you have it through the credit card statement is not sufficient. Yeah, that's true. That's a, I think it's a good point. Um, but we're not really talking about audits. We're talking about accounting and categorization. So uh, yeah, at some point, it will be valuable for you to have uh, those receipts. And there's some, some categories that it needs to be over a certain dollar amount or under a certain dollar amount, $75 is a magic number in some cases where you would need the receipt or no, something like that. Okay, um, yeah, so the polling question's up, please finish answering it. The results are exactly the same. <laughs> so we'll keep going. All right, so let's do matching. Now matching, it's a bit more complex. I think matching takes a bit more thinking. Okay, 
Um, so we can, we're going to go through this. Let me use uh, a bank instead. So that was a credit card. I'm going to go to a bank. And then what I'll do is I'm going to take a look at a, at a, let me just sort it by the most recent date. I can see a more recent transaction. So good, good example here. So there's a couple of things I'm going to show you with, um, with uh, matching. First, let's work under the premise that uh, every time you get paid, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between an invoice you generate and a deposit to the bank. When that's the case, matching is fairly simple. So for example, I invoiced a client, let's look at this one, this one for 712. I invoiced a client $2,250, as you can see here, and the deposit is $2,250. When life is that simple, matching will be simple. So let me go into a different tab here. And I'm going to go into invoices. And I'm going to create an invoice. Let's say on July 1st, make up a customer here. Customer one. I'll pick one of the items here. And we'll make this 2250. Uh, I think that's the dollar amount. So I have an invoice that was created in QuickBooks, likely prior to the whole banking situation. I, I, I created the invoice on July 1st. Then my customer paid me, just do a save and close here. Then my customer paid me, it looks like on July 11th or the 12th, and I went to the bank and I deposited, okay? If the dollar amounts are one-to-one, -one, I'm gonna refresh this so you can see, there's gonna be what's called a match. You see it right there. It's very clear, very obvious. Let me zoom in and get rid of this navigation bar. There's a really obvious match there. I right? QuickBooks says, yeah, hey, I figured it out. I'm a genius. AI is amazing. I, I figured out that this deposit matches this one invoice. Okay. That's kind of step one. I can click on that and I have the option to reject the match by switching this to an ad. I have the option to do that. Uh, or I have the option to accept the match at the offer that is giving me, which is to match it to invoice 1101, okay? Now, things get more tricky. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna accept it. I'm just gonna X out of this. What if there's another invoice to a different customer to the same dollar amount? So I'm gonna come in here. I'll duplicate this invoice. I hit copy. And this will be customer two. Totally different customer. I'm gonna date this maybe two months back. Same dollar amount. Now, I even changed the item to kind of switch things up and I'll click on save and close. So I got two different customers with two different, uh, wait, what happened here? I got two different customers, of 2250, okay. So I got two different customers, but the same dollar amount, uh, two different dates, right? So how does, how does Bank Feeds manage this? I'm gonna click on replay and show you what happens. You're no longer gonna get what's called a uh, wrong account, sorry, let me go back into the bank account. So by date, no, I don't remember which account I used. So let's do it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, uh, so no longer you will get uh, the green match. You get kind of like the white and green match that says, Hey, I found two transactions. I went ahead and suggested the oldest invoice in this case, my logic, typically you're paying the oldest invoices first, but I'm going to suggest both of these. Now notice that the first match was kind of a bold green. And this one is a kind of white and white and green, letting you know, kind of just changing the dynamic of this thing, saying, hey, there's two potential uh, matches here. Now, I'm gonna take it one step further and do things even more fun. I'm gonna take the same invoice and I'm gonna bring it back one year. I'm gonna click on save and close. So now this is a really old invoice in this case, really old invoice, okay? Same invoice, I don't think I changed the dollar amount. Yeah, same invoice. It's now dated 2018. I'm gonna refresh this. And notice that no longer it chooses that as a match. It no longer thinks that this payment has anything to do with that old invoice. So there is a 90 day window. That it might be six months. I, I have to test it to see exactly what the right window is, but it, it might, it's a 90 day window in which QuickBooks looks backwards and forwards to see, hey, could this even be a match? Now, you could still manually match this by clicking on find other transactions. And then from here, I can change my date. Okay, this is the date range here. 413. How many days is that? 413 minus 722. I don't know. 
I don't know how many exact days is that. I don't know where the mathematical logic comes into play on this, but for some reason, that's the default date range. So I'm gonna run it here in Excel real quick, just for fun, to see what exactly, how many days is here. I really don't know what the logic is on that date range. So uh, let's see. Okay, it's 100 days. Okay, well, that's, that's the answer. So it's 100 days and 99 days. So, um, so QuickBooks goes back and looks at 99 days or 100 days, and that's within the scope of the automatic matches. So you would have to manually change the date range and, and bring it, you know, I guess one year back or whatever, uh, if you want it to be now within the scope of more. And notice that now it gives me multiple options. So now I can actually manually select an older invoice and match it. So it really gets tricky uh, based on uh, the date range and the future. I don't know what the few, I haven't tested uh, the future ones. We can do it right here on the spot. It's actually not that difficult. Let's, like a, let's take a look at this one, Three, uh, 3575. So let's change the other invoice that we have open here to 3575. So 3575. Three, and we'll make this, let's say, August 28th. So I'm making it more than 30 days in the future. I'm going to click save and close, go back into banking, click on refresh to see if it picks that one up. So it, it didn't pick it up at all. Okay. So there might be a limit. I don't know how many days it is. There might be a limit just for the heck of it. Let me choose like maybe nine days. Okay. Something uh, about sh a lot shorter. So today's the 19th. So we'll pick maybe the 27th. That's um, July. July the 27th, right? That's within, uh, yeah, 18th, that's within, that's a bit more than a week. I'm gonna hit save and close, go back into banking. Um, sometimes this is my idea of fun, t testing, testing things out. So there's a limitation to the future. I don't know how many days it is. I'm gonna guess it's 10. 10 is kind of a magic number in the QuickBooks world. Um, so it's 100 days back or 90 days back or 10 days forward around there. And that's how it does the matching. Now matching gets a bit more complex when you have a combination of things. So let's take a look at this one. We have 2065.16. Let's say that we have two invoices that the, the sum of the two add up to that dollar amount. So let's do that real quick here. We'll create one invoice here. Let's do customer A. And let's say one invoice is $2,000. We'll make this July 1st, hit save, and then we'll do, uh, let's duplicate, let's duplicate it, copy. This will be customer two. Okay, I'm gonna make this, let's say, a month before, and this would be, what was the dollar amount? 65.16, 65.16, beautiful. So I got two separate invoices that the addition of the two could potentially make up uh, that deposit that's showing up there. So I'm gonna click on refresh, and QuickBooks will not, will not on this screen, uh, again, QuickBooks will not on this screen suggest a match. Okay, that's not how it's built for now. So I'm gonna click on that. What, what it will suggest is an ad. But one thing that's kind of awesome, awesomely mind-blowing is if I click on find match, QuickBooks will actually search all possible combinations within that day range that will get you there. It's pretty amazing. Now, let me show you this. This, again, this should blow your mind. Technically speaking, it should blow your mind. So let me, I'm gonna hit yes on that. Let's, I'm gonna go back and make this invoice, let's say $1,200, and I'll click on save. And then I'll duplicate this one, and I'll make this one $400. Okay, and I'll click on save. And I'll duplicate this one more time, and I'll make it maybe another month old, and I'll make this $800. So there's actually multiple combinations that essentially might get us there. So again, I'm gonna hit refresh here. And this is where, I mean, this is where the genius of QuickBooks Online really lies. The, 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 the QuickBooks Online team, the one that does this stuff, they're incredible. I mean, what they've been able to do with this, it's pretty awesome. So notice that it, it actually will look at the combination of transactions that could possibly get you there. So right now, if I click here, it says here, this is one of the suggested. So I click on this, it will calculate which combination will get me there. Now notice that this one that's 400 is by itself. I forgot to do one more. I'm gonna do one more and uh, duplicate this 400. 
So now there's going to be two possible combinations uh, that will that will get us there. Okay, so I have multiple combinations that could pot potentially do this match. And notice what happens. Let me get out of this and go to uh, banking again and go to find match. So I'll go to find match. Okay, and let's just make sure that we have everything in here. So notice that within this date range, there's two potential combinations. There's a combination of four invoices. So I can click on that and it'll give me the four invoice that gives me this, or I can do the combination of three invoices that get me there. Now, again, that's really, really awesome stuff. I mean, the, the way, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, you know, technically speaking, AI, uh, program, programmatically, this is all really, really awesome stuff. And I commend the QuickBooks Online team for being able to achieve this. Is, this is amazing. Now, of course, of course, the problem with this is that customers get really stupid and they don't just click whatever and click save and it squares up and that's it. And what you're really supposed to do is look at your actual deposit slip and look at the actual payments and match up what you're supposed to match up to make sure your AR is correct, your customers are correct. You need to make sure all this stuff is right um, because if you don't make sure this stuff is right, it's going to be wrong. And the, the more, I think the more uh, easy that they make it, uh, unfortunately, the, the more it gives the illusion of the customers and the end users that this stuff is easy and doesn't require a lot of work. And this is a gap. This is bridging the gap between now and whatever the future may be where accountants are no longer needed to do this type of work. But for the time being, if you know how to use these tools as the accounting professional, you can save tons of time. And if you know how this works and how your, quick, your clients are potentially making a mess, you also will know exactly what, uh, what is happening. So I'm going to click on save on that. And then I'll do one more uh, before we wrap, wrap things up. It's a very common request, which is what happens if my payment has uh, a merchant fee built in in it somehow. So that'll be the last one that I'll show you. So let's say, for example, that this particular payment was really an invoice of 3,800. So the one you're looking at on the screen here for 3,715, that's really an invoice for 3,800. So let me uh, make an invoice for 3,800 here. So 3,800. We'll do the beginning of the month. And then we're going to go back into bank feeds. And that shouldn't at all match it or or do any sort of a matching it shouldn't i guess that that's you know gross minus a merchant fee so what you do is you click on that and then you're going to click on find match okay and then you're going to select uh the uh, the account or uh, the invoice that's related to it now you're going to see that quickbooks by default what they're going to do is they're going to basically reduce the amount of payment application um the amount of payment application that, that needs to go. So we're going to do 3,800 manually. And then we're going to click on resolve. Okay. So I'm going to resolve. And then in here, I'm going to put a uh, merchant fee, whatever it happens to be. Merchant fee. And then the amount will be negative 84.32. Okay. So in here, what you're doing is you're accepting a transaction that came to the bank. You're accepting the invoice amount to be a higher uh, dollar amount. And then um, there's a, um, the difference, which is the merchant fee. So at, the, at this point, I click on add new transaction and click on save, and that will match the payment together with a fee. Okay. All right. That was uh, a lot. Let's switch over to, I'm going I'm to see if there's anything open in the Q&A that I may have missed. Let's just go back into the PowerPoint here for a second. Um, and I think we covered everything that we were gonna cover. I don't think I missed anything. This is actually pretty amazing within the world of, um, of, of, Hector, <laughs> of Hector webinars um, that to, to stay within time. Now, the couple of things I wanted to mention, bank feeds, one of the purposes of bank feeds is to, um, to automatically clear your transactions for the purpose of reconciling. So I'm gonna show you one more th last thing. It's actually really, really important that I shouldn't dismiss how important this one is. Let me go into, um, back into QuickBooks here. I'm gonna go into the reconciliation screen. So I'm gonna go into the gear menu. I'm gonna click on reconcile. And I'll pick, uh, I'll pick uh, this here, this bank account. Let's do Chase Primary. 
and I'll put here zero and today's date, and I click on start reconciling. You will notice here that there is uh, dates and there's clear dates. And these two things are different, especially when we're dealing with checks. So I have to do an example with a specific check here so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go into banking here and I'm gonna look for a check. Let me look for the primary account here. And let me go into, okay, so this check here. Uh, let's do something that's more recent. Let's see what checks we have. There you go. So you got this check for 4350 that cleared on 712, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the transaction originally in QuickBooks with a different date, okay? So I'm gonna go into a different tab here and I'll go into create check. Okay, so you have to make the assumption that you printed this check or created this check before you even went into bank feeds. So uh, check 1317 for 4350. So 4350, 4350 is the dollar amount and the check is 1317, 1317. And uh, the payee, let's say this is uh, a check to me, Hector. And I'll pick the Chase primary and let's say this is a subcontractor, okay? See, I love my chart of accounts. And this check was written, let's say, June 1st. So this check was originally written June 1st. Dollar amount is 43.50. The check number, what was the check number? It was 1317, so 1317, okay? And I'm gonna click on save. Again, within the premise that we created this check before we even did bank feeds. So we created the check. Now when I'm in the bank feeds world, I'm gonna hit refresh. That's going to be a match. That's going to, that's going to match the two checks up. There you go. There's a match. Naturally, um, that's really the purpose of matching. So it matches things that are already in QuickBooks, not just invoices, but payments too. I'm going to click on match. And then what I'm going to do is when I go into my reconciliation screen, something that's really, really cool and important really overall is that in my reconciliation screen, I'm going to see my original transaction date, which is 6-1-2019, and then I'm gonna see my clear date. That is awesome, that is amazing actually. Because there's a lot of, when you're reconciling, there's a lot of context that you can read between original transaction date and clear date. That was the last note, I wanted to make sure I added, I didn't wanna miss that one, because that's actually crucial, that's actually kind of the genius behind bank feeds, is uh, increasing or improving that reconciliation uh, process. So.